Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy. Forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us as we Welcome to Grace and Peace Austin. We are a gospel formed, form, gospel formed family for the city, uh, and there is room for you. My name is Mac Vetter. I'm the worship director here, and it is a joy and privilege to lead and worship with you this morning. Uh, we are sad not to be together due to the weather, but it's really nice to have this way of worshiping that was, is already familiar to, uh, to us online through YouTube. Uh, so if you are worshiping with us from home in your living room, wherever you are, why don't we stand together to respond to this call to worship now it's on page three of your bulletin. You can bring that up. Um, it's on our website. We'll try to post that link in the comments here, too. So, page three of the bulletin, the call to worship. I'll do the, the celebrant part, and we'll respond to the people part all together. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. I will praise the Lord and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's pray. God, we praise you for who you are. God, we praise you that you are um, the glorious and great God who has created this um, world and um, and everything in it, God, I pray that uh, this morning you will draw us more and more to you, God. Um, make us more and more into who you um, would have us be in this service, God. Pray that you'll open our hearts and open our minds um, to the things that we'll read and we'll sing together, the things that we'll hear. Uh, yeah, God, we thank you for, for all of this. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing together now the song of worship, Come Thou Almighty King. <laughs> thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us ancient of days. Come now incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer and give thy word success spirit of holiness on us descend come holy comforter thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour thou who almighty art now rule in every heart and there from us depart spirit of power Eternal praises be, hence evermore, thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, into eternity love and adore, into eternity love and adore. Well, 
Well, friends, it is now time to confess our sins um, to God and to one another. We'll use that, uh, or we'll do that by using the confession of sin. It's printed here on page four of your bulletin. Um, and so let's, let's confess together now. If you're still standing at home, um, continue standing because we'll, we'll sing after that. So let's confess together. Loving Father, we confess that sometimes we think we can do things all by ourselves. And sometimes we are worried about things. We forget that you give us everything we have and that you make us who we are. Please forgive us for thinking about ourselves first. Please forgive us for not trusting you to take care of us. Thank you for always loving us, even when we forget that we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a moment now to silently confess in our hearts, and I'll end that time of silence by leading us in a song. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's sing together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Kyrie eleison, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, if you're standing at home still, you can take a seat. We invite you to join me in our assurance of pardon, and we'll do this a little bit differently than we usually do here at Grace and Peace. Uh, you're going to participate. You'll see there's a part for the celebrant, that's me, and there's a part for the people, that's you and me together. And so, now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, our psalm reading this morning comes from Psalm 131. It's actually the entire psalm. It's a short one. Uh, you can follow along on page 5 in our bulletin as I read. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised up too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we have the opportunity to extend the peace of Christ to one another, and we're glad to be able to do that. Even though we're distanced, even though we're not necessarily in the same room with one another, we can still pass the peace of Christ to one another because that peace is ours because of his work on our behalf. So this is more than just a Christian hello. This is a way to recognize with one another we are in right relationship and so we can live forward together in within that good relationship. So the peace of Christ be with you no, and also with you. Greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace. You can do that obviously with your family or roommates if you're in the room but also in the chat box if you'd like to do that um, virtually as well. Take a moment now and pass the peace of Christ.
And the scripture upon which our sermon is based is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. If you're in your Bible and you're trying to find Ecclesiastes, find Psalms and then flip forward just a little bit, you'll get there. Uh, If you're following along in our bulletin, you'll find it printed on page 6. This is Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 17. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from all his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its own time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, and that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Pray with me. Gracious God, we do thank you for your words. We thank you for this opportunity this morning, or perhaps for some of us it's afternoon or evening, but we thank you for this time that you have given us. This is the season that you have appointed for us to draw near to you and to receive your presence and your grace and your love. And so we say thank you now because we need it. We need your words. We need your truth. We need you, Jesus, to be more true for us, more beautiful for us, more believable for us than when we began our time of worship this morning. And so would you be that for us? Will we, we will return thanks to you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me add my welcome to Max. I'm John. I'm the pastor here at Grace and Peace Austin. And as Max said, there's room for you. We're a gospel-formed family for the city. Uh, not thrilled to be all worshiping virtually on this Sunday morning, but Uh, The weather didn't cooperate. The weather acted within its season that God has appointed, not that we appointed. It's just another reminder of what Ecclesiastes calls hevel. This world in which we live, and when we're honest, we recognize this, it's not meaningless, but it is outside of our control. And it is, at times, impossible for us to fully understand. Though God has placed eternity in our hearts, the teacher tells us, we cannot know the beginning from the end. But, friend, and this is a huge but for each of us, God can, and God does, and we can trust him. And when we trust him, we can live well in this world. That is wisdom, living well in God's world according to his ways. And the only way that we can do that is to trust him. And when we do, then we can be present in each and every moment with joy doing good for others. This is what the teacher gets at in verse 12. He says, I perceived, and this word can also be translated, I believe that there is nothing better for us, for human beings, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they, as long as we live that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. How do we live well? We are present in the moment. 
Well, because uh, we are virtual and not within the time constraints of um, our gathered worship at Brentwood Bible, I'm going to read an extended quote. This is from Blaise Pascal. He gets at, um, at this reality that life is lived well when we are present in the present, in the moment. He says this, We, human beings, broadly speaking, never keep to the present. We recall the past. We anticipate the future as if we found it too slow in coming and we're trying to hurry it up. Or we recall the past as if to say, stay, it's too rapid flight. We are so unwise that we wander about in times that do not belong to us and do not think of the only one that does. That is the present. So vain that we dream of a time that we are, uh, uh, so vain that we dream of time that are not and blindly flee the only one that is. We think how we are going to arrange things over which we have no control for a time we can never be sure of reaching. Let each of us examine our thoughts. We will find them wholly concerned with the past or the future, and thus we never actually live. We hope to live, and since we are always planning how to be happy, it is inevitable that we should never be so. I know that's a little long, I know that's a little heavy, but man, does that not feel like it was written for me? And maybe, does it feel like it was written for you? Do you resonate with that? You recognize that being present in the present to take joy in the gift that God has given us, and to do good for others. That is the way to live. And yet, do you feel that tug of your mind and your heart toward the past or toward the future? Do you find yourself in your heart, with your thoughts, with your attention, even with your desires, oriented toward a time that has been or a time that is to come, not the time that we actually have? And as much as we do that, we miss out on living well, both for our own joy and for the doing good for others around us. Um, let me give an example of how this might feel like. Have you ever found yourself uh, having coffee with a friend? And maybe this has even happened recently, and it's, it's been a joy and a privilege to be able to sit across a table from somebody and to have a cup of coffee and a conversation. And so you want to be present in the moment, and yet, as you begin your time at the coffee table, you find your mind wandering back to the email that you received from your boss. Or maybe you didn't even open the email, but you know your boss is responding to that project that you had turned in the week before. And so your mind and your attention and your heart is backward. It's on what has already happened. And your attention is there. And then when you draw your attention back to the present and you try to engage with your friend again in the moment, what you find is you're listening to your friend talk. And then as your friend is talking, you're thinking forward into the future of how you're going to respond to what they're saying. And you miss the joy and the good of the moment with your friend. Why do we do that? If we know that living well in this world means living in the present, just as the teacher has taught us in this passage. If we know that it means receiving the present as a gift from God, then why do we so often live in the past and live in the future with our minds and our hearts, and sometimes even our actions? And the teacher in Ecclesiastes would say, you've missed the lesson of verses 1 through 7. The reason so often we live in the past and live in the future. Well, apologies for the change in uh, filming perspective. If you noticed it, we had some technical difficulties, um, but we're back. And so we're asking the question, why is it? What is it about ourselves that is prone toward the past or the future rather than remaining present in the present, even though we know that that's the best way to experience a joyful life for ourselves and a good life for those around us. And the teacher in Ecclesiastes would tell us we've missed the lesson of verses 1 through 8. 
rather than understanding the times and the seasons of our lives as under the control of a good and all-knowing and sovereign Lord of history, we think that those times and seasons are ours to control. And when we do that, we end up missing the present for the past and the future because we're not made to handle it. We're not made to be the Lord and the gods of our own lives. It's beyond us. And so when we try, we're doomed to the frustration and to the toil that the author of Ecclesiastes describes, right? We're consumed by the past because if our lives and our seasons are ours to control, then what happens when we don't do that well? And what happens when we fail? What happens when something slips through our fingers and, or doesn't go the way that we intend it to go? Our minds and our hearts are drawn back toward that failure because we know it's gone and there's nothing we can do about it. And yet we yearn to and we long to because we need to control everything when we feel like we're meant to be in charge. But the same thing is true of the future. We're always oriented toward the future because there's something else. There's another season that I need to prepare for, another time that I need to be ready for, another activity that I need to make sure goes the way it's meant to go. And so my attention and my energy and my focus is all toward the future because I've got to make sure that that's right and good and ready if I'm in control. But friend, this is the, lessons of, the lesson of Ecclesiastes. Life is hevel. The seasons are hevel. They are not ours to control. They're beyond our control. They're even beyond our understanding. Though God has put eternity in our hearts, that longing to know how everything fits together and works together for good. For now, in this world, we cannot know from the beginning, from the end, and that's okay. We can let that go. We can set our control down open up our hands and receive the times and the seasons as a gift from God, a God who is good, a God who is in control, a God who makes everything beautiful, uh, fitting in its own time. And if we paid attention to these seasons that we see in verses one through eight, we, we would recognize that we can't control the seasons of our lives. It begins with a time to be born and a time to die. Did you pick when you were going to be born? What a silly question, kids, right? You know this. You didn't pick when you were going to be born. You were just born. And the same, of course, is true for our deaths. Uh, friends, you know that we're coming up this week on the one year, and or we did come up this week on the one year anniversary of the pandemic being officially declared a pandemic. And we didn't orchestrate the times when it is appropriate to embrace and the times that we are now in when it has not been appropriate to embrace. We didn't get to orchestrate that. These seasons are beyond our control. I would have said that this would have been a time that we tried to orchestrate an in-person gathering and an online option, and yet that's not the way it worked out. The times and the seasons are not ours to control, a time to tear and a time to sow, that's in verse 7. And that gets to relationships. There's a time when relationships are built up, and there's a time when relationships tear apart. And we'd like to think that we can orchestrate those relationships to make sure that they last and never tear apart. And yet sometimes they do, because there are other people involved. And as we think about our control, or the way that we long to control life and the time and the seasons, we recognize that as individuals, we can't control our own paths, right? As a parent, we can't even control the way we get our kids to church on time without trial and travesty. Sometimes the seasons don't go the way we plan them, even in our own moments. But what about when those moments are interacting with other people? Well, then they're doubly beyond our control. And the whole point of verses 1 through 8 is that these seasons happen to us. They're not controlled by us, but they are under the sovereign control of a good God. And so how do we live in the present? By learning to trust the God who is in control of our times rather than control those times ourselves. And this is where we find ourselves in verses 14 and 15. 
The teacher says, I perceive, again, I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken away from it because God has done it so that people fear before him. And that word fear, it's not talking about being afraid of God. It's talking about an awe and a reverence toward God. It's talking about a trust in God who is in control of the times and the seasons. As we've said, who has made everything fitting and beautiful in its own time. A God whose activities stand the test of time. And so when we're trusting in this God, we don't have to be constantly focused on the past, on trying to recall those times in the past and bring them back into the present. We're not constantly focused on the missed opportunities or focused in nostalgia on those times when things seem to be going well. We can trust that God stands in the midst of time. Actually, he stands over time. And all things that have been done or will be done are under his control. And those things that we think are past and gone and cannot be recovered, God can recover those things. The things that we long might be redeemed, the missed opportunities, or the ways that we've broken relationship in the past, those things God can restore and God will restore in his good time. Friends, we're reminded in this passage that what is already has been, that what is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. He can recall the past into his present for us, and he will do that. We're promised that he will do that at an appointed time when he comes to both judge and restore. See, this is where it becomes so critical in our ability to trust God is to recognize that sometimes the things of the past that have gone wrong or the things of the future that we're trying to orchestrate are things of justice and things of righteousness. And when injustice happens, how are we to know that all that will work out in beauty and in goodness? That can only be true if there is a good God who will one day restore and judge. And so we're told in verse 17 that that's exactly what will happen, that God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. So do you want to live well in the present? The antidote that the preacher gives us is to trust. Trust that God is in control. He's making things beautiful. He will recall the past and we can trust him because we can think about the way that he came and engaged our time and our season. And of course, he did that in the person of Jesus. And we haven't reflected a whole lot about the season of Lent within this sermon series, and maybe we could do that now. So we think about Lent, and Lent as the journey, journeying with Jesus toward the cross and the resurrection. We're journeying with Jesus, who in his resurrection is crowned as a sovereign over all things, in control of all things, including our times. And why can we trust Jesus with our time and with our seasons, even when we can't fully understand them or control them? We can trust him because he submitted to his appointed time. In the fullness of time, we're told, God sent forth his son, Jesus, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who are under the law. And how did he do it? With his very own death. Friends, we can trust that Jesus is good and will make all things beautiful in their time because of what he did in time for us. By taking our sin upon himself. So that when it comes time for judgment and restoration, we can have full confidence that we will be restored. Not because we deserve it, 
but because Jesus earned that for us. Friends, what does that mean for us now at Grace and Peace Austin as individuals and together? How might we lean into being present in the present because Jesus has gifted it to us? And let me just leave you with this as a thought. Now, another Lent homework assignment. If you haven't given anything up for Lent, don't worry, you don't have to. But here's one thing that you might consider giving up for these last few weeks of Lent, and that is your hurry and your frenetic activity. Consider giving up hurry for Lent and beyond. To put it the other way, consider putting on a slower pace of life. Dallas Willard uh, is a pastor, uh, was a pastor, who uh, would always say and was famous for saying, if you want to experience the goodness of life with God, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry. We're speeding forward with all the things that we feel like we need to do so that we can control our times and our seasons. Friends, slow down. Consider with your family or with your roommate or with your parish mates what it might look like for you to go a little bit slower this week so that you might enjoy the present and be good toward others in that present. And we can do that because God has been present in time for us in Jesus. Let's pray our thanks to him. And we do that now. We thank you, um, God, for who you are in Jesus. And we thank you that you are in control of all things. That though we cannot fully know or understand what season is coming next, and we confess that we don't, we also confess that we long to. And so we ask that we could trust you in this next season of life as we move forward in this uh, continuing pandemic world, but changing. Uh, help us to trust not the circumstances that might happen, but the way that you are in control of all that happens. Give us joy and grant us your grace so that we might be good for others. And we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship now as Matt comes and leads us in our prayers of the people. Uh, we usually have an elder or a deacon leading our prayers, but because we had the last minute shift to uh, this in-person filming for the virtual service, well, you get Mac and you get me. So we'll continue to worship now. Let's pray together. Oh Jesus, you know the anguish of our human lives. As one who sees the pain of those who suffer, bring comfort, peace, and strength. As one who has experienced the agony and tears of losing loved ones, comfort all who grieve. And we especially bring before you, God, those now that we know that have recently lost, lost loved ones, God, the, the lies and Hannah Phillips and her family, we pray that you will um, be with them in their grief. Bring them your comfort. Jesus says, one who wept over the faithfulness of your people, send your spirit to correct us in our unfaithfulness. As one who understands the agony of those who have been deserted, stand alongside those who feel alone and abandoned today. God, those that feel alone and abandoned even now, God, be with them. As one who is once forsaken, or who was once forsaken by all others, give hope and assurance to those who feel rejection. As one who knows the ravages of violence, bring peace and healing to those who are tortured by real and present enemies. You, our Lord, have offered up prayers with loud cries and tears. Lord, hear us when we do the same. We approach your throne of grace with boldness, God. May we receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Lord, as we've passed 
uh, milestone after milestone, especially lately in this pandemic, uh, over a year now in it, over 500,000 in this country alone and millions elsewhere dead early from it. God, we grieve over that. It's overwhelming to even consider. We thank you so much for the, the vaccine that is quickly being distributed um, and the hope that that's brought to so many. We pray that you'll, that will continue, God, and, um, and that soon we will be back to a level of normalcy that, um, that we haven't had for a while. God, I pray, praise you that that's close and help us to rejoice in that as it becomes more and more of a, of a real thing. God, we thank you for um, the many things that you've done, even in this hard time and in this pandemic. God, I pray that you'll help us to be able to see those and be thankful for those. And we end this time of prayer, God, by praying the, the prayer that your son taught us. Praying together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we'll continue on in our worship uh, by professing our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. Uh, you can find that on page 8 of the bulletin. I think it'll also be on the screen. But page 8 of the bulletin. Uh, why don't we stand together now, actually, as we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth. Make us in your image, or made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whose grace we may triumph over temptation. Be more fervent in prayer, and be more generous in love. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Let's sing together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full, full of your glory. Hosanna. Friends, as we continue on in our worship now, we'll sing the song Psalm 51 together. Uh, and so let's do that now. Oh, have mercy, God, according to your steadfast love. According to the richness of your tenderness and grace, 
Wash me thoroughly from all of my iniquity. Lord, take all of the sin from me, for against you I am wrong. Let these bones that you have broken rejoice, rejoice. Let me hear in joy and gladness your voice, your voice, create in me a clean heart, God. Renew your spirit in me, God. Cast me not away, O oh God. Restore to me your joy. before me go for me does not but evil flow I can't escape the curse you are justified and blameless Lord if you decide to judge me in my heart he cried for I was born in sin let these bones let these bones that you have broken rejoice rejoice let me hear in joy and gladness your voice, your voice. Create in me a clean heart, God. Renew your spirit in me, God. Cast me not away, O oh God. Restore to me your joy. sing our last and final song uh, the sending song this week is all must be well if you're sitting at home why don't we stand together for this last one
couple quick announcements just before our benediction. Uh, the first is that our student ministry group is meeting at Brentwood Bible today, 12.30 to 2.30. That's the fifth graders through the eighth graders. Um, and this is, of course, weather permitting. If the weather turns, you'll receive word. Um, also, as you know, Holy Week is quickly coming upon us, which is a wonderful thing. And so we just want you to know that the RSVPs for the Good Friday service and the Easter Sunday services are up, and you can access them through our newsletter. If you are not not yet receiving our newsletter, uh, please get in touch with us by emailing Jeanette at graceandpeaceaustin.com. We'll look forward to seeing you at those services. Now let me invite you to lift up your head and your hearts to receive God's benediction. This is his good and his sending word to us. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go forth, remembering who you are and to whom you belong. With God's help, we will. Friend, go in his peace. Thank you.